Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Prague YouTube channel. Normally, this channel is in Afrikaans, but we've got the occasional uh, interview in English, like with the Nati Kwaza and so on. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. All the same, just click on the subscribe button and the bell, so you don't miss any of our exciting interviews and commentary. Now, today, I'm honored to be talking to a very famous person from America. Mr. Jared Taylor, he's an author, an intellectual, an activist. He's been all over the world, um, and he's been cited in very many uh, mainstream publications as well in the U.S. I think you've even been on CNN once or twice, haven't you, Jared? Yes, yes, that's correct. Uh, well, and, uh, oh, NBC and Fox, uh, uh, not, they don't generally give me very sympathetic appearances, but uh, they sometimes are interested in what I have to say. Well, as long as they, well, they say all publicity is good publicity, don't, don't they? <laughs> Although <laughs> I, I've, I've yes. had some experience myself with bad publicity. So. <laughs> yes. Well, we, we're going to um, talk in, in, in three parts. We're going to do a bit of an overview of uh, the conversation, and then we'll, uh, I'll also uh, tell you exactly how I met up initially with Mr. Jared Taylor, and he's invited me several times over to the U.S. Um, and then in the last part of the interview, we'll, we'll get into some of the nitty-gritty, some of the major issues around diversity and race relations in the USA. And, and it's very important for South Africans to know this stuff because you, you, don't, you won't really understand what's going on in our country and with the policies that the ANC are applying here unless you know something about America because they've, they've almost just copy-pasted a lot of the policies from the U.S., like affirmative action, minority procurement, which here became majority procurement, and, and that has created this entire unfair system that we are laboring under at the moment. Um, I'm going to show you also Mr. Jared Taylor's book, which um, I want to refer to here and there. It's called uh, White Identity. Racial Consciousness in the 21st Century. And it's about the various ethnic or racial groups in the U.S. and the fact that they've all got a very strong racial consciousness. I'm going to quote, read you a quote just now that, that I really like from that book and which is also up on our web page. Um, in, in fact, uh, I'll, in the description of the video, I'll put the link to the page where you can buy the book. It costs 200 Rand in South Africa. We've got the stock right here in, in the country. And even from overseas, you can order it. There are some instructions for that as well. But those of you who have been buying some books over the last few weeks, uh, you know, we, we guarantee you almost uh, within 48 hours, you'll have the book delivered by courier uh, for a very low cost as well. So, um, Mr. Taylor, you, you've also just um, made a video about, well, both of us, in fact, you invited me for a bit of a talk, and we made a video about Brendan Horner, the, the, the man, the young man who was murdered in near Paul Roo recently, didn't you? Yes, yes. Uh, people in the United States who are concerned about the demographic future of their own country and of the survival of Western civilization, pay close attention to South Africa. And what happens in your country is a kind of bellwether for the future, I believe, of uh, the Western world. Uh, according to demographic trends, people in the in whites in the United States and in Western Europe are destined to become a minority. Of course, in South Africa, whites are already a minority. And so, in some respects, we see our future in your country already. And so what happened to Brendan Horner and the reaction to his uh, torture and murder is something that we follow, and I made a video about that, and I was very grateful for the commentary that you provided that I included in that video. Well, it's only a pleasure to give you some information about what's happening in our country. And I think you're playing in a, a very important role in disseminating news about South Africa that, uh, in the U.S. and, and that, that mainstream media don't always carry. 
Um, in fact, the, the video we're referring to, I'm gonna, it, it's, it's gonna be up on the same page as the book on the Prague web, website. And I'll also, have, yeah, you, you'll just click on the link in the description of, of the video below and, and you'll be able to watch the video as well. Get the link from there because it's not on YouTube. It's, a, it's on a thing called BitChute. You've probably yes. heard about that. Now, yes, and, and there are these huge similarities between the U.S. and South Africa, aren't there? Um, you know, apart from the affirmative action and so on, you've also got a, a, a we've seen this whole Black Lives Matter explosion, uh, the riots, you know, we've got riots all the time and protests, and, and you've got the same thing there. Well, you know, what has happened ever since the death of George Floyd in May of uh, this year, there has been a real change in what's considered a race riot. Race riots have traditionally, certainly in the modern era, been composed of black people, by and large, looting and burning down their own neighborhoods. There was a gradual beginning of participation of whites in these things in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, when we had the famous case of Michael Brown, who attacked a police officer and was shot. But then the story got around that uh, he was trying to surrender and was shot brutally. That didn't happen. But there were riots in Ferguson, Missouri. Then later on, there were riots in Baltimore over the death yet again of a black man, a criminal named Freddie Gray. And there began to be a certain amount of white participation in that rioting. This was a new thing. But ever since May of this year, there's been a real change. And the rioting was initiated by blacks. But many whites have joined in. And you may be aware of the fact that in Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington, there has been a steady continuation of demonstrations, riots, ostensibly in the, names of, in the name of Black Lives Matter. But these are carried out almost exclusively by whites. This is a brand new thing. And to me, it marks a very important change in the thinking of many whites who now appear to believe that they personally are somehow responsible just as all whites are somehow personally responsible for the failures of blacks. And this has led to all kinds of changes in American society that I frankly had not anticipated. So I believe we have a real difference when there is some alleged grievance among blacks. I don't think you find South African whites demonstrating and looting and burning on their behalf. You are not at that point, and I suspect you will never get at that point. So this is a big change now between the United States and South Africa in that respect. Well, yes, uh, we, you know, we, we've also got a website called Free West Media, an English language website that we uh, run together with a few Europeans. And when we've actually covered a lot of that where, you know, the white participation in the riots. I think to some extent, we, we used to have that in the past, prior to the takeover of the ANC, there, there was a whole bunch of um, radical white leftists who used to uh, almost demonstrate on behalf of blacks. Yes. Um, but as blacks assumed political power, they didn't need these people anymore. And, and a lot of them have also become disillusioned with black rule. Um, they've actually written books about that and so on. E even there's a woman called Shirley Gunn. I may have mentioned her to you who was uh, an ANC terrorist, but she was a white uh, female terrorist. Um, I, I think I wrote it in, in that article for your website, American Renaissance. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, we, we also mention, um, you know, in the description or on the page with the book, uh, your website, which people can go and uh, consult, amarine.com. So we used to have that in the past, but the disillusionment now with, with black rule is such that even the leftists, uh, you know, they, they don't see it as, as, a, as a utopia anymore. And they, they see all, all the problems. And this ex-woman uh, terrorist, female terrorist, Shirley Gunn, even she has 
apparently resigned from the ANC. She's no longer one of them. So we're sort of further down the road, I would say, uh, than That's, you. That, that is the tragedy of white people taking up the burden of blacks and people of other races. They don't see ahead. They don't look into the future far enough. They don't realize that if society changes in the way they say they want it to change, it will not be a, an agreeable society. It will not be a success. I wish the example of someone like Shirley Gunn were far more widely known in the United States because, yes, you are further down the road there. You really have given blacks power over your lives. And the way they are exercising that power is very, very ominous for the future of whites in South Africa. At least that's my perspective. Yes, I, I think everybody watching this channel would agree with you. Um, we've also had the, you know, all the, the, the sort of more, obviously Shirley Gunn was a Marxist and a radical, and, but, but a lot of the liberals and, and what we uh, call here the verlichters, you know, at, at one point, uh, there, there was a whole debate within the National Party between the Verlichters and the Verkrompters. The, the Verlichters are the enlightened ones and the Verkrompters are the sort of what you would call um, maybe the reactionary ones. But all these Verlichter or enlightened people from the past, they've also become very disillusioned. And if you read what they're writing now, I mean, what I said 20 years ago, I, I can now read in the Afrikaans mainstream media. They, they now agree with me, but 20 years later, you know, that, that's the kind of situation we're in. But now, maybe you know, we, we, we can uh, go over, perhaps uh, we'll, uh, we'll refer a little bit more to, to your book, or White Identity, where you actually cover each racial group in the U.S., and, and you also mention all the various incidents that... Um, you know, occur in the United States at the, the kind of the same sensitivity that blacks have uh, towards being insulted and, and so on, the N-word or the K-word that, that we've got here. I, I see, uh, my, you know, just paging through it, I, I saw that incident where uh, there was a white um, air hostess who, who told some black passengers, any, meeny, miny, mo, uh, yeah. where do you want to sit, you know? And then... Yes. Uh, one of the black passengers saw, sued the airline. Yes. I remember, do you remember that passage from your book? Yes. Um, it was uh, the, the, the little rhyme was, it was in Southwest Airlines in which there's no assigned seating. And so when the passengers come on board the airplane, everyone has to sit down before the pilot can take off. And she said, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, take a seat, we've got to go. And uh, this is, I don't know how well that rhyme is known in, uh, in South Africa. We, we've got the same kind of rhyme, you know, any, many, 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 it's very well known, yes. Yes, and uh, it uh, ordinarily, well, when I was a child, the rhyme was any, many, many, mo, catch a tiger by the toe, if he hollers, let him go, any, many, many, mo. And it's a way to count out to decide. And when you land on the final mo, then that is a choice of, say, if you've got three different people and they all want the same piece of candy, you go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and, and, the, and you land on the person and he, that person gets the piece of candy. Well, in the, a very ancient version of it, it was eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a, and then the N-word, which we white people are not supposed to pronounce, by the toe. And the black passenger sued the airline because this just saying any mini money mo take a seat you've got to go we've got to go evokes some kind of insult to blacks it's astonishing that a case like that would even be permitted by an american trial judge well actually it ended up uh, the airline prevailed on this but that is the kind of exquisite sensitivity that blacks now have in the United States. Anything is an insult. My suspicion is that flight attendant was probably a young woman. She had never heard the original eeny, meeny, miny, mo catch an N-word by the toe. She'd probably never, ever heard that, heard that. And so this was utterly innocent on her part. And yet uh, this black woman just flares up in anger and sues the airline. 
this kind of thing happens very frequently. Any kind of even harmless or even slightly ambiguous encounter between whites and blacks is now considered a microaggression and it's an excuse for for whites to uh, i'm sorry for blacks to flare up in anger and to try to put white people on the back foot keep us on the defensive as a means ultimately of exercising power over us and extracting benefits for themselves yes well and, and i must recommend to the you know viewers uh, jared taylor's book um white identity, because it's a whole encyclopedia of incidents like that, including the crime and so on, that, that we'll get into a little bit later in this interview. But, uh, but if you don't know anything about the U.S., and I mean, I, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, I hardly knew anything about the U.S. And, until I started reading your website and, and your book and, and some of your other books as well. Uh, you know, people here are quite ignorant, I, I think, of uh, exactly how bad ra race relations are in the U.S., whereas the U.S. is often held up to us as, as some kind of model that we should follow in, yes, in South Africa. Yes, yes. That, uh, I don't, of course, like American cities being burned down. I don't like seeing nightly riots in Seattle and Portland, but... If there were ever images broadcast around the world to show that diversity is not a strength, that the United States, this multiracial exercise is not a success, these are very, very eloquent images. Now, to my chagrin, this has led to Black Lives Matter demonstrations in Korea, for heaven's sake, or Japan. <laughs> Well, yes. now, what on earth? This is uh, just insanity. What is it that the Koreans or the Japanese, why are they taken up in this? Well, of course, it's because they are fed this steady diet of mainstream American media news to the extent that everything that goes wrong for black people anywhere in the United States or at any period in world history even is the fault of whites. And therefore, I think these well-meaning Koreans and Japanese, they're going to get out and say, well, these poor black Americans, they're being persecuted, they're being killed, they're being mistreated in all sorts of horrible ways, and this has got to stop. They are very well-meaning people, but of course, they are acting in this way because they have a completely inaccurate picture of the way the United States works. And I'm glad that you have put it in those terms because this book, White Identity, it's been translated into French as well. And the French edition also is an introduction to French people as to what this multiracial attempt is really like in the United States. And to me, the verdict is in. It's a failure. It's not working. It's not good for anybody. And the sooner we can recognize that it's a failure and try to unravel this terrible tangle we've got into, the better for everyone. Well, of course, I, I wrote an introduction to this South African edition uh, of the book, which appeared a few years ago. Um, and then maybe at that time, people weren't ready yet for, for this book because, you know, we, things were still a bit more peaceful at that time in South Africa, unlike now, and also in the US, uh, of course. But there's one particular quote, which I, you know, paragraph, which I quote in my introduction, which struck me as, as being such a, you know, powerful um, characterization or summary of black identity in the U.S. And I think when you look at people like Julius Malema and the EFF in South Africa, and even the ANC, you, you can apply that same definition to them. Um, it's where you say in the book, and I quote from it, Anyone who looks closely at black racial thinking and behavior will see that 50 years after the civil rights movement, blacks are as far as ever from adopting the race blindness that whites assume all Americans must achieve for multiracialism to work. Blacks nourish and take pride in an intense combative racial consciousness. It is only a matter of time before this gives rise to an increasingly explicit white racial consciousness. You surely remember that, that passage from, from yes. your text. Yes. Uh, 
The whole idea of the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1950s and 60s was that all Americans were to dismantle any racial solidarity, any racial thinking at all, and to treat all of their fellow citizens as individuals, not as members of a racial group. And whites, I think, made a genuine and sincere effort to do so. And many whites are still doing this. They don't seem to recognize the extent to which every other racial group in America, and it's not just blacks, Hispanics, and Asians, those are the large other groups in the United States, they do not think in those terms at all. They have a very vivid sense of community, of solidarity, and they uninhibitedly advance their own interests and if that's at the expense of whites, so be it. They don't care. And more and more whites are gradually waking up to this. But the number is, to me, still surprisingly small. And that was one of the purposes of my writing this book, is to explain, look, white people, this was not the bargain of the civil rights movement in which we were all supposed to hold hands and be individuals and all Americans and forget about race. The idea was to build a society in which race could be made not to matter. I don't think that's possible. That goes against human nature. It's as unrealistic as trying to build a society based on the Marxist principles of from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It all sounds wonderful. And many smart, committed, and I think well-meaning people fell for this idea. We're going to build this Marxist paradise. Well, look at the terrible human cost. Well, I think we are seeing the same thing in the United States. We wanted to build this wonderful multiracial paradise. And what we see now is the terrible human cost. And ultimately, it is whites who are paying the highest price on this, but it is whites who deliberately maintain a blindness in the face of this very clear, hostile racial identity that blacks in particular, but that other groups have adopted against us. And if we don't wake up eventually, we will find ourselves in your position and eventually just shoved into oblivion. I see no other alternative. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and, and it's obvious uh, that, that in South Africa, um, you know, we, we Afrikaners had their own ideas about uh, ethnic identity and so on that, that um, held sway during the old um, system. And, and some of those ideas were thought up by very clever people, you know, highly educated people and so on. I mean, somebody like Ferwut, for example, was a great intellectual in his own right. But then we, we copied all these ideas from the Anglo American, you know, from the Anglo American um, system, and particularly the American system, because at that time I think uh, Britain was not yet uh, such a multiracial society as it is at present. But but here yeah, they 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 thought of this absurd term, non-racialism, which you know it corresponds to what you would call a colorblind society in in the US and and we've also seen this that this whole notion of non-racial it just doesn't apply at all in South Africa the very people who use it are, you know our government and so on they've got 120 laws laying down um, you know regulating the races in economic life and ownership of companies and in the job market and so on. So, so it's, an, it's a complete absurdity, non-racialism. Well, unfortunately, my country has been the source of a great deal of insanity, uh, not just in racial matters, but uh, we won't go into some of the areas. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> so, but, yeah. <laughs> There's, there's a never-ending list of the insane things that Americans, to be considered well-meaning people, are required to believe. But, yes, the idea that we're going to build a colorblind society and we're all going to be colorblind. Now, as you probably know, and perhaps your viewers know this, maybe some don't, 
In the United States today, the theory is if whites claim to be colorblind, that's not good enough. It's not enough to be trying to treat all people the same regardless of race because that erases the valuable and wonderful racial characteristics of blacks or Hispanics or Asians. And so white people, we simply can't just go about our lives trying to be fair. No, that's not good enough because that continues to prop up white supremacy. We have this inherently white supremacist society and unless we are actively tearing it down, Every moment of our lives must be devoted to somehow overcoming white supremacy, racism, institutional racism, systemic racism, these will-o'-the-wisp concepts that mean really nothing at all. Institutional racism. What's that? How can an institution be racist? Presumably, there are people who have ideas that are discriminatory, but systemic racism. If you ask Americans, what about the system is racist? I mean, the system is apparently something that operates independently of the human beings that are part of it. No, this is just nonsense. It's, ma it's black magic. But today, I can assure you that certainly on the left, the idea that white people are striving for or that all of us should be striving for a colorblind society, no, no, that's not good enough. White people must be constantly devoting themselves to, and then it gets very vague as to how it's supposed to work, but we're all supposed to be devoting ourselves to tearing down white supremacy, affirming the unique beauty and virtue of all other people, so we dare not treat them the same. Now, if we treat them differently, that was presumably racism in the past. If we now treat them the same, that's not good enough either. But in the, the United States has an astonishingly negative view of whites. And another example of this is when there were white neighborhoods and blacks moved in, white people moved out because they did not like living in black neighborhoods. That was white flight. And that was sinful and bad and no good. Now there are black neighborhoods close to the middles of cities. And younger whites are wanting to move in. Mostly they don't move in when they have families, but if they're single, they might want to move in and they, they, uh, uh, the rents increase and they put in these nice coffee shops and secondhand bookstores and the things that white people like. Now that's called gentrification and that's bad too. Whites are wicked <laughs> when they leave. Whites are wicked when they come back. There's just no way to win. And likewise, if we say, okay, we're going to treat people all the same. No, no, no. You are erasing the unique beauty of black people or Asians. So that's no good. But if you treat them differently, that's racism. You just can't win if you're white in the United States. And yet at the same time, we're all told we benefit from all of this wonderful white privilege. Every last one of us, white privilege from cradle to grave. And it's there. I think for people not living in the United States, it's almost impossible to understand the current thinking about race that leads to all of these white people like, wearing their little masks, but out yelling, Black Lives Matter. And this is to me, perhaps the most idiotic slogan that has arrived since May, since the death of George Floyd. And this is, white silence is violence. In other words, <laughs> yes. if, if white people are doing nothing, if we are not constantly speaking out against white supremacy, we are committing acts of violence? What, I mean, do we have superpowers? Are we magicians of some kind? You and me, in our sleep, saying nothing, we are somehow committing acts of violence against black people? This, this is absolute insanity. And yet white people say white silence is violence, it's mostly women. You see these young women waving these signs and they're very earnest about it. How can they believe this preposterous rubbish? But this is widespread in the United States. And I think you would have to live here. You'd have to see it happening in order to get a really genuine sense of how deeply rooted this is in certain portions of the American population. Well, over here, of course, um, you know, especially yeah, since the ANC took takeover, you know, they, they've sort of 
almost abolished uh, Afrikaans culture at the universities and in uh, in the state institutions and so on. So we've been relegated to the margins and now we sing songs and write a few books and, and we chat on the internet, but we, we sort of marginalized in, in this setup. But of course, you know, there, there's something a bit colonial about um, South Africa too. And uh, these powers that be in South Africa, both black and, and some of the white university people, academics and journalists, they've simply copied all of this stuff from the US, you know, when, uh, not a day yeah. goes by without us hearing about white privilege as well and systemic racism and, and the effects of apartheid. Well, that will, yeah. that yeah. will last for centuries into the future. Right. And even when blacks are corrupt and they steal us blind, uh, you know, they, they, I just read a story about, I think I sent it to you about some woman who, who who was married to a general in the army and then they stole 200 million rand from the army by means of tender fraud and so on. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff, ultimately, whites get blamed for that. Because That's they right. say, That's well, the legacy. Exactly. You know, blacks are not responsible for their own actions. They behave in that manner because somehow through white, uh, you know, what would you call it? Um, white evil or uh, in, in the past, uh, you know, blacks have come out this way. But now, there's also a notion that, that people like you and me who question all of these dogmas, you know, about multiculturalism and, and the non-racial society that doesn't exist anywhere, that we are somehow stupid or uneducated or whatever. Whereas, um, yes. you know, <laughs> paradoxically, I think, uh, well, I think that there's a singer here in South Africa who once said... Uh, uh, you know, when his, people said that about me, that I'm just a stupid person. And then he said, his name is Chris Combeza, a very famous and popular singer here. He said, no, no, you're making a mistake. Dan Root is cleverer than most, than all of you put together, you know. And, and yeah, you're also somebody with a, a very kind of, call it a diverse education. You grew up in Japan. You, you speak Japanese fluently. So you've got experience of another non-Western society. You also lived in France. You've got a degree from the Sciences Po in Paris. Um, you, you went to Harvard, to Yale, uh, one of the great universities, the Ivy League, top Ivy League universities in the USA. So you're a highly educated person, um, highly, you know, widely read and so on. And you've come to the conclusion about these issues because you've, you've examined them honestly. Um, well, uh, I, I certainly think that's the case. I, I used to be very much an egalitarian and a liberal. My parents were missionaries in Japan. They had uh, a typically missionary view that all people are children of God and are equal and should be treated in an entirely colorblind way. And uh, I adopted their view of the world because that's the way most children grow up. And it was only in my 30s or so that I began to study and travel and reflect and realize that, uh, no, uh, the world doesn't work this way. But it is amusing. I used to be invited to colleges and universities in the United States to talk about these matters. And uh, it always struck me there was always somebody in the audience who would get up and accuse me of saying ignorant things, ignorant things. <laughs> this is something I've been studying very carefully and thinking about for many years now. But if you don't agree with the dogma, then you are ignorant. I remember also having a conversation with a journalist who at first took that view. And the, as the conversation went on, I kept citing facts that surprised him and facts that he had never heard of, the implications of which annoyed him. And he finally, he switched from saying that I was ignorant and accused me of being overeducated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, okay, all right. Uh, if, if your conclusions are disagreeable, then you're ignorant. If your reasoning is superior to theirs, then you're overeducated. You just can't win. It's like whites leaving a neighborhood, white flight's bad, they come back into the neighborhood, gentrification, 
That's bad too. You can't win. So yes, I, I'm frequently called ignorant by people who have thus haven't the slightest notion of what they're talking about. Yeah, well, the same thing happens to me. Um, well, you know, about in 2005 or so, um, just because I, I, I referred somewhere to the bell curve, um, then uh, there, there was a whole group of uh, academics down in Stellenbosch who tried to stop me from participating in the so-called Wirtfies down in Stellenbosch at the university there. And it was the same kind of thing. Yes, you, you're just ignorant if you don't believe like uh, like we do, but uh, right. or if 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 you if you don't ignore those facts that exist yes. out there. That's right. In order in order to be a properly educated person, you have to be totally ignorant about fundamentally important things, and those who know about these fundamentally important things are dismissed as ignorant. It's just such a topsy turvy world we live in. Uh, this, I gather, it is the case in South Africa as well. Yes. It is an, a, an impossible taboo. You are not supposed to bring up average IQ differences between blacks and whites. And of course, in the United States and in South Africa and in every multiracial society, if you are forbidden to talk about group differences, then you are obliged to think in terms of systemic racism or institutional racism. In America, if we find that blacks are more likely to be poor, more likely to be badly educated, more likely to be in prison, more likely to have illegitimate children, et cetera, et cetera, and the list goes on. If we are forbidden to say, well, maybe blacks are not on average as intelligent, maybe on average blacks do not have the same temperament as whites or the same ability to defer gratification. If we are forbidden to say these things and the only explanation left is that we, white people, have persecuted them in the past, we have tormented them in the present, and so every detectable difference in achievement between blacks and whites is our fault, and we must make it up to them. Of course, what this, uh, what this approach always ignores is the differences in achievement between East Asians and whites. If we have a white supremacist society that is constantly pushing down blacks and elevating whites, why is it that East Asians, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans make more money than white people, have lower crime rates than white people, are less likely to be in jail, more likely to be admitted to Harvard or Yale or Caltech, the great universities? Why is it that by practically every standard, Asians, they live longer, they are less likely to be uninsured for medical, medical expenses. By practically every measure, East Asians are better off than Caucasians. Well, and you know, I, I, I read, um, sorry to interrupt you there, but I, I read not so long ago that, um, uh, you know, that, that the police in Japan have nothing to do anymore because uh, the, the, there's just no crime in Japan. The, the crime is so low that the police have no, you know, are sort of out of work and they, they've, they've got to find other things to keep themselves busy because they, they, they just don't get uh, crimes um, reported to them. <laughs> they don't have to go out anywhere to stop people from doing bad things. Now, now the whole issue of race and crime, in you in the United States, at least your authorities are still honest enough to publish the statistics about who commits murder or rape or other, other violent crimes. Whereas here in South Africa, that was one of the first things that they did was to uh, make it, a, to, uh, there's now a complete taboo on that. And unless you examine the statistics of where crime gets committed, and it's mostly in uh, areas where there are a lot of blacks, you know, in, in the and even mixed race people, colored people down in the Cape. But for example, one of the highest crime areas is the inner city of Johannesburg, which is completely black. Uh, more people, maybe 80 to 100 people get murdered there, which is higher than entire, than this rate for, or the number for entire countries in Western Europe. Uh, you know, in Switzerland, maybe, um, 
you know, with a population of 7 million people, there would be maybe 30, 40 murders in a year, whereas just in the inner city of Johannesburg, there are twice as many murders in, in that small area where maybe 100,000 people live. Now, well, what's the situation like in, in the U.S. regarding race and crime? That, that, that's also documented in your book and some of your other writings. You've also written a book, The Color of Crime. Yes, uh, The Color of Crime is a monograph that we have updated twice that has a very detailed examination of the race of crimes, of the race of criminals, differences between different racial groups. And uh, as you say, our government, for the most part, keeps pretty good statistics. It certainly distinguishes almost invariably between blacks and non-blacks. Now, one of the difficulties in trying to understand crime in the United States is that the federal government does not distinguish between whites and Hispanics. It considers Hispanics to be white. And so you have to do a fair amount of sifting to try to get Hispanic crime rates separated from white uh, crime rates. But there are cities that make the distinction. Certain states distinguish very carefully. What it boils down to is that blacks are usually seven or eight times more likely than whites to be in jail in the prison population. And the case for Hispanics is maybe three times more likely, two and a half, three times more likely. The Hispanic elevation in crime rates compared to whites is not nearly as great as that of blacks. East Asians, at the same time, usually commit most crimes at a rate that is maybe one third, one quarter, not even one half, the white rate. Uh, this is something that is consistent year in, year out. Wherever you go in the United States, Asian crime rates are lower than whites. Hispanic crime rates are higher than whites. And black, Hispanic, black crime rates are the highest of all. So that if you find, uh, the, and there are certain crimes that are black specialties. Mugging, for example, and that's an armed robbery. Mugging is something that blacks commit nationwide at a rate of, of about 12 times the white rate. Any individual black person is about 12 times more likely to commit a mugging than a white person. Differences this great in sociological phenomena are very unusual. If you're looking at large populations to have a difference that is as great as that. And this is despite the fact that many blacks are in jail the actual difference in terms of the cr different, different criminal propensities of different groups would be much higher if there weren't so many black people already in jail. Yes, so that, that, even... that, that, that's something that has struck me um, as, as, as quite astonishing is, is the number of black people in prison in the United States. Because in, in South Africa, we know that there's a very low conviction rate. Only 8% of murderers actually get arrested and convicted of their crimes. So about 80 or 90% of our criminals are out on the streets that are actually not in prison. But in the U.S., there, there are over a million prisoners, aren't there? And, and there are, yes. I think, over half a million blacks in prison. And in some states, I think I've read probably in, in some of your books or reports that a one out of three black males, say, between the ages of 20 and 40, would be either in prison or on parole or under correctional supervision. Is that's that correct. correct. That's but, correct. Uh, that's simply astonishing. So, you, you know, in, in a sort of more or less white society like yours, still white society or controlled by white people, um, in order to uh, make it function, you, actually, you literally have to lock up about one third of young black males. Whereas, we, yeah, we're not going to be able to do that. Right. Yes, uh, in order to maintain a certain level of peacefulness, but in many respects in the United States, when it becomes clear that blacks and to a lesser extent Hispanics cannot follow the law, then the laws are changed. Uh, one of the best examples of this is uh, turnstile jumping or fare beating. You just push your way onto public transportation without paying. 
This uh, has been clearly the case in cities like Chicago or San Francisco or uh, New York City, Washington, D.C., and then it becomes a scandal. We find out that 80, 90 percent of the people who are arrested for not paying the fare and sneaking onto public transportation are black or to some degree Hispanic. And so the cry goes up, this is unfair, this is no good. And so the authorities stop enforcing the law. Uh, we've seen this in case of shoplifting, for example. In San Francisco now, if you don't shoplift more than $800 worth of merchandise, the police are not going to bother. And so it becomes free game. People Even will just if walk you're in. white, because I, <laughs> yes. you know, it could be a good idea to... To visit San That's Francisco, right. and you know, if you wanted to, yeah. That's right. Get, get That's some right. brand yeah. name clothing, you could just go and shoplift it. But I suspect if you are white, they're probably going to prosecute you, aren't they? No, they're not. And this is this becomes a terrible problem when white people see non-whites getting away with this, because the rules are changed essentially for everybody, or when they see black people jumping the turnstiles into the subway, many, so at least some white people are going to say, well, why have I got to be the chump? Why am I the only guy paying my way? So all of society's rules fall apart when you have a population that refuses to abide by them, and then you just take away the rules. You're quite right. Well, we see it here in that um you know we've, we've got these black minibus taxis and they don't stop at red lights they just go through the lights or you know they they, they disregard the traffic rules completely and we used to be uh, you know our standard of driving used to be very good um and people were very courteous and and we used to drive safely compared say to people in southern europe and italy or even in france uh, where i lived you know we we used to very orderly in our driving but now it's that is all fallen by the wayside and and you know yeah if a white person sees the the black driving through the red light he thinks you know why should i stop um right. if i'm in a hurry uh, i'll just do the same yes, yes. but to get back uh, to the notion right. of white identity in the states well in your book you say that whites don't really i mean they, they believe in this kind of colorblind society or what we call here by this absurd term non-racialism but here in the, uh, so whites don't have a very strong identity in the u.s but in south africa i think that's very different to be because our circumstances force us i mean we, we are kind of designated as the enemy as the white and even to the liberals and so on they, they realize that they are white to to, to some extent um, well, but what are they doing about it? It's my understanding that at least in the English-speaking press in South Africa, there is the kind of Black Lives Matter, white people are racist mentality that prevails, uh, is it not? Yes, you're quite right. Yes. Yeah, you know, the kind of uh, media elite and the ac academic elite and I think even some of the very rich business people, uh, that they've got that kind of notion, but um, I, I think over the last year or so, or so we've seen, um, you know, a, a very strong kind of white Afrikaner identity coming to the fore, and especially now after Brendan Horner's murder, and uh, probably people watching this channel would know that, uh, maybe I'm repeating myself a bit, but um, a few weeks ago I had an interview with uh, somebody from Thierry Baudet's party in the Netherlands, um, Forum for Democracy, her name is Simone Kasselboom, and she grew up, she, she went to school in South Africa and to university here. Mm -hmm. And she said that people in the Netherlands could learn a lot from Afrikaners because for most of our history, because we were under the British Empire and revolting against them or trekking away from them, and now with the blacks trying to destroy us and destroy our language and our identity we've always had to fight for our identity and then that, that makes us you know the, this notion of being in an identity kind of struggle all the time has characterized us uh, for a long time and and i think maybe you know we've, we've got some contribution to make there because we are not you know it, it's quite funny sometimes when you're in a conversation 
among people here and they would say yes uh, us whites you know or, or they use this afrikaans term de blancos you know us blancos um you know and, and it's completely natural to them whereas anywhere else in the world in the u.s or let alone in europe where even people on the right of the political spectrum they are very reticent uh, to refer to themselves as us whites you know it's always yes. a bit about culture and civilization and so on but they, yes. they never want to bring it down to us whites yes yes well you know this is something that i learned really or became aware of thanks to you uh, i can't remember how long ago we first got acquainted but it's well, it was in the, the sort of early 2000s and then you invited I, me in 2006 yeah. to your conference there just outside washington um, yes. Well, yes. I think it was in Virginia, so well, not That's too far right. from where you Virginia. live. Yes. And then my wife and I went there, and mm -hmm. I remember, yes, that, that, that's where yes. we first met up. And, and then I was also in 2012 at that conference in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, the, the one that couldn't take place, that was that's <laughs> right. out in secret yes. or something. Yes. And then yes. in 2016 uh, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Yes. Um, that one. Well, so, Yes, no, no, you have been uh, a, a very uh, well-received guest at our conferences and said very interesting things that uh, our audience has always found enlightening. But uh, what I became aware of because of you is this sense of a really distinct Afrikaner nation. I was aware of whites in South Africa and that there were English speaking whites, British origin, and then there were the Boers, there were the Afrikaners. But I never had such a distinct sense of how different the two groups are and how you as Afrikaners had a genuine nation, uh, a language, uh, a, a, a variant of, of Christianity, a kind of state church almost. I mean, maybe that's going too far. Well, he, he, well I mean, they, they, they used to say that the, we, we've got this big uh, Dutch Reformed church, the Ingeer Kerk, and they, you know, the liberals here used to say that the Ingeer Kerk was the national party at prayer. <laughs> Yes, so, I so yes, that. And, and, and they see, saw themselves as a state church. And in fact, yes. they've been, now they are trying to become the state church again by accepting homosexuals and, you know, right. again, completely overboard in the other direction. Yes, yes. But the fact is, you uh, are a nation and uh, someone like Paul Kruger, for example, who fought the British and who really get, devoted his life to independence for his people. You have a history of real nationhood. I wasn't very consciously aware of that. And here was this, this wonderful, distinct people with a distinct history and culture and heritage and destiny that your nation was really strangled in its crib. It was, it was thwarted very early on by the British and then what with uh, uh, all of the fight against apartheid and all the world ganging up against you, you have this distinct, and uh, for those of us who really appreciate, appreciate diversity, a genuinely different culture, one of these beautiful things. And it's, it was snuffed out, first of all, or the uh, assault on it came from fellow whites all around the world, and now that you have submitted yourselves to black rule, as you point out, your universities and uh, the medium of teaching and your culture is being attacked. This is a tragic thing. It's a terrible thing. And this is something that I came to understand really only because of the things that you wrote and the things that you have said. And that heightens my sense of just the horror of what is happening in your country. Well, uh, well, thank you. you know, it's, it, 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 well, thank you for appreciating, uh, you know, for complimenting me, but also for appreciating the tragedy that, that we are yes. living through. And, and that hopefully we, we will be able to overcome if enough people start, you know, pulling together because we have in the past, um, you know, pulled off miracles almost. And I think we are still capable of doing that. Um, well, I certainly hope so. And I certainly hope the reaction to the Brendan Horner murder is a sign of the Boer people really taking their destiny in their own hands. But the odds are 
more are stacked more heavily against you. Not only is all the world against you, but now your own government is in hostile hands. It's going to be a very difficult situation, but I certainly hope that you will be able to survive and prosper as the independent and beautiful and distinct nation that you are. All of this is uh, its just an incomprehensible tragedy. And I feel as an American, uh, a, a terrible regret for the role that my country played in building up this funeral pyre for the Afrikaner nation and people. It's just a terrible thing that's been done to you. Yes, you're quite right in that, yeah, especially the Democratic Party in the US and people like Joe Biden as well. I mean, in the, 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 there's a video doing the rounds at the moment, um, you know, we he also went on a rant against uh, the, that repulsive Afrikaner government in South Africa. And, and he doesn't know anything about the conditions here um, and, and what we've been through and, and how we've evolved uh, to our current situation. Yes, and even the Netherlands that used to be, you know, kind of our motherland, mother country, or, you know, the country where we come from, uh, even they in the, in the 70s and 80s, they funded uh, terrorism from the ANC, which they also regret now, now that they've realized, you, you know, well, what the conditions are now. But yes, we'll all just have to overcome all of that. But uh, at least the, I would say that, you know, well, in 1960, there was that famous speech by um, the British Prime Minister here in South Africa, Chamberlain, where he said the winds of change are blowing through Africa. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the sounding the death knell of, of white governments, white minority governments. But now there, there's another wind of change, at least, blowing through the world. I, I think in Europe and, and in the United States, there is Trump's presidency, to some extent, has also changed a lot. Um, but, well, what, maybe we can... Um, on as a final point, maybe I could ask you, well, what do you think of Trump's uh, prospects um, in this election? Well, of course, I have no inside information. Uh, I suspect that he will lose. But then I thought he would lose last time around, apparently, according to the polls. And the pollsters are being a little bit more careful because they got it wrong last time. But according to the polls, he is even less likely to win than he was in 2016. So I think we have to prepare ourselves for a Biden-Harris uh, administration. What that will mean for Americans, uh, I think, is a return to the increasingly suicidal policies that have governed the Democrats and have also governed the left, the churches, the universities, the media. And so the future of the United States looks pretty grim in that respect. If by some miracle, uh, Donald Trump uh, is reelected, then that will certainly slow down the dispossession of whites. But unless Donald Trump arrives at some kind of more systematic and sophisticated understanding of race and the demographic future of the United States, it's all just a delaying action. Nothing decisive will take place. When he was first elected, I thought to myself, he is perhaps a president who is capable of saying in some offhand way, well, why is it wrong for whites to want to remain a majority in their own country, the United States? I thought he might conceivably say such a thing. And that would set off, of course, a, a huge stink and a huge discussion, but it would be a very useful conversation to have. Why should whites want to become a minority? And the other thing that I thought he might say is that, well, you just can't expect that blacks are going to be the same percentage of the population as they are in the population as astrophysicists or investment bankers. You just can't expect that because there are group IQ differences. Now, this too would set off a huge stink, but it would open up these questions to some kind of national conversation, whereas today it's absolutely forbidden. 
if the president of the United States says these things, it can't be ignored. But if I see these things, then I'm kicked off of YouTube. We used to have a great YouTube channel. I'm kicked off of Twitter. My Facebook account, my Facebook account is banned. Amazon refuses to sell our books. Our views are being suppressed in a very severe way. And as you are probably aware, a, a scandal has come out about Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden. And the social media are trying very hard to make sure that this news doesn't get out. What could be more clear interference in an election than that? And we're supposed to be terrified of the Russians or the Iranians or the Chinese influencing our, influencing our election? Well, if you have these huge media controlling empires making sure that something unfavorable to one candidate doesn't circulate, that is election interference of a most intolerable kind. So in the United States, I think if Biden is elected, all of that will be worse. Immigration will increase. The wall on the southern border with Mexico, they will stop building. it. No attempt will be made to deport illegal immigrants. There will be a huge attempt to grant amnesty to all the illegals who are here. And as Joe Biden promised, illegal immigrants, he said all illegal immigrants in the United States deserve free medical care. Th this is crazy. That alone would be a huge incentive to someone who lives in Guatemala and who needs a new kidney or who has heart valve problems, those people are all going to come to the United States because Uncle Joe says, we're going to fix your problems for free. Frankly, I think even Democrats would wonder if that's a wise thing to do. But that is the direction in which the Democratic Party is moving. And all of this bodes ill in a terrible way for my country. Well, yes, and, and that's probably why people in the U.S., as you said at the beginning, are looking at South Africa as, as one conceivable um, version of your future, where you would yes. become a minority and, and dominate or, or dominate it by um, you know, the other ethnicities in your country or even a, you know, a section of the left, of the white left, together with the uh, ganging up, together with... Hispanics and, and Blacks and Asians and so on against you and, and you could find yourselves uh, on the receiving end of this kind of anti-white system that we've got yes. here in South Africa and, and, and that gives us a, you know a, a common bond as being kind of comrades in arms because we are ultimately fighting against the same kind of insane yes. system well, yes. which you rightly mentioned, uh, which is not too far different from communism, because they are trying to make something work that can never work, and that goes against human nature, and, and yes. it, it cannot be created. There, there will yes. never be complete equality, and there will never be complete racial harmony and racial equal, uh, equality no. in the world. No. We, we, we see it here in South Africa, too. Well, as I say, we are part of a world brotherhood of Europeans. Some of us are Europeans who no longer live in Europe, uh, the Afrikaner people, American whites, Canadians, Australians, but we are all part of this world brotherhood and we all face the same problems. And that is something I find so gratifying when I do travel around the world and meet people like you, and like some of our comrades in Europe, they all understand they are, of course, a minority in their own countries, but they see the crisis, not only that their own country faces, but that their white brothers and sisters face all around the world. We all have the identical struggle. And to me, one of the most dismaying aspects of this is that the ideas who have, that have made this struggle so acute, so many of them have come from the United States, this notion of diversity being a strength and that we can build this non-racial society. Nobody ever said that sort of foolishness until Americans started saying it. And the crazy thing is that despite our failures and despite the obvious failures in Sweden or France or Germany, where immigrants have not assimilated 
in any kind of satisfactory way and clearly show that not only they refuse to, they don't want to, but still this insane philosophy of multiculturalism, multiracialism prevails. It is, uh, it's been the great mystery of our era, I believe, why these ideas, which are obviously false and obviously destroying ancient countries with ancient civilizations, why these ideas are still in circulation and still so powerful? Yeah, well, I, I think I've uh, probably, I think it might have been at one of your conferences, you know, I mentioned the, the notion that, that this um, multicultural idea, multiracial idea, it's got something, it's got all the hallmarks of a kind of sectarian faith, that there's yes. something you believe in, in yes. against all the evidence. And one can only, and I think a lot of people have also compared, um, you know, the, the, what we're facing now with what people were facing, you know, people like Copernicus and Galileo when they said the earth was round, you know, and the church just said, no, no, you're wrong. You know, despite the yes. evidence, you are wrong. And yes. that's exactly what we are facing today. Despite all the evidence that we can muster, it's just you're wrong and you must just um, conform to the dominant um, ideology of, uh, you know, well, so-called multiracial society. But the real problem here is this is a delusion and this is a religion that is suicide to us. This is a religion of white wickedness. This is a church in which there is no salvation, that white people can never get it right you will find on the left the idea that not only are white people not supposed to be colorblind, they have to devote their lives to trying to overcome their own racism, society's racism, and they will never succeed. We will be guilty until we die. We'll be guilty after we die because we have created this legacy. Ordinarily, if there's some sort of illusion, it's because People at some level profit from it, either materially or psychologically. But in this case, this is a religion in which the adherents are all guilty and can never be saved and which will ultimately destroy their own country. This is to me makes it even more difficult to understand. The church, when it was fighting Galileo, it had an interest in maintaining its own authority for all sorts of obvious reasons. And even if the earth rotates around the sun, believing that or not believing that was not going to destroy the church. But we are told to believe things that ultimately will bring about our own oblivion and the, own dismantling, and the dismantling of our own cultures. So it makes this delusion, this religion, even more inexplicable. Yes, you're perfectly right. And I think you've put it very well um, there. Uh, but perhaps South Africa will be the first casualty of this religion because, uh, you know, uh, we will be facing in the not too distant future societal collapse uh, as a result of it. And yes. perhaps that will, you know, at least uh, in, in some small way persuade a few rational people in the Northern Hemisphere that they may be on the wrong track. And, well, and within that chaos, you know, there, there could be also opportunities for us. That, that, that is what we have to hope. And uh, with a little bit of help from the outside, yeah, we could perhaps again uh, regain our freedom. But thank you very much for this conversation. Oh, it's um, been very much my pleasure. Mr. Taylor, and I hope we can repeat this some, somewhere down the line. And uh, to our viewers, uh, well... I hope you've had a yo. Know, you've had quite a um, good introduction to Mr. Jared Taylor, and as my uh, well, our ex countrywoman who now lives in the United States, Ilana Mercer, who also writes uh, on uh, Anne Marine on American Renaissance. Uh, she's a lady also from Johannesburg, who now lives in Washington State, and she's got a beautiful English style of writing, fantastic. Um, you know, uh, use of language and so on. 
and and she says she also told me once that you're one of the great intellectuals of our time and and definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know about that uh, in fact i think so much of what i say is just obvious it's easy to seem like a brilliant intellectual when the entire world has gone mad and believes things that are obviously untrue. Well, yes. <laughs> I think it's like the old dodge. If you, you find yourself self in a lunatic asylum, asylum and everybody else thinks you're mad, then, then you must be the only sane person among the inmates. Yes. But then thanks again, uh, Mr. Taylor. And uh, well, yeah. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to the viewers, and I'm gonna put the uh, yeah the link to the page with uh, Jared Taylor's book in the description, and you can see for yourself, uh, read for yourself about the the insane situation going on in America. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Goodbye.